I, I feel a little better this service than I did last service. Um, I haven't preached in three years. <laughs> and it was like, oh, dear God, I don't know if I can do this anymore. And, and it's a part of, the, of it is as you get older, you, you, this just doesn't work like it used to. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Anybody here that's older, you know, um, I'm getting within spitting distance of 80. And uh, I'm like, oh, Lord, you got to help me. I, I'm desperate. And uh, I don't know. I think he did. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I felt really good. And, but I went in the back, and I was just crying out to God. I said, God, one more time, <laughs> just one more time, anoint me and help me. Um, and because uh, this is going to be a different sermon. Um, I don't, I haven't been preaching anymore. Uh, and I really don't mind that at all. This is pressure, folks. I'm here to tell you, it's pressure. But I love to write. And Miss Linda and I have been writing now for going on, how many years, hon? Uh, eight years. We've had our, our um, website and our, our monthly newsletter, Truth With John. Um, um, truthwithjohn.com is the website. If you've never been there, go check it out. If you have a cell phone, you can check it out right now. I give you permission. Uh, but um, we have three articles each month, a bunch of photography. Uh, anybody like our photos? <laughs> oh, my goodness. Uh, we, we get excited about the photos. But uh, we have three articles. And now here's the deal. Um, don't just go and check it out. Subscribe. Now. Here's where we run into trouble. I say subscribe. People say, how much is that going to cost me? Zero. Not a dime. We don't charge for anything. You can't buy anything off our website if you wanted to, okay? But if you subscribe, here's, here's why we do it, and we do it for nothing. It's because if you don't subscribe, I guarantee you, you're going to forget about us. And I don't want you to forget about us, Okay? <laughs> I, I, I want to be able to be in contact with you. I will not bug you, but once a month when our new issue is out, you will get a shout-out from us, an email, and it will give you a snapshot, very small, little paragraph, about that long. You can read it. You can read what each article is about. Take you about 10 seconds for each article, whole thing, about 30 seconds, and then you can decide. Do I, is there something there I'm interested in? If not, hit the delete button, it's gone. And, but if you want to read something, you're interested, wow, what is that? You click on the button, it takes you right to the website, and there's a page. Every article is there. You click on it, or you can listen to it as well. We do audio as well. So uh, that is why I want you to subscribe. And I want to say... I, I'm excited. We had 25 new subscribers after the first service. Yeah, yay. So um, check it out, and you'll find out there's some good stuff there. The, uh, the message this morning is taken from an article that I wrote and published, I think it was back in March, maybe. Yeah, March it was when I published this. Uh, the, time, uh, the, the title of it was The Timing of the Rapture Revealed. This is a subject that is really, really important, and it's a subject that has been just debated for decades, and you have people on every side of the issue, and it's not as far as, like, well, when the timing of the rapture. Uh, is it going to happen this year? If anybody ever tells you they know the answer to that question, just get up and walk out, <laughs> because nobody knows, okay? I don't claim to know, but... The timing of the rapture revealed in connection or relationship to the things that the Bible talks about that are coming on this earth. Namely, Daniel calls it that time of trouble such as never has been since there was a nation. Jesus talked about it. You can go in the book of Revelation. You can read more detail about what's going to be happening on this earth. It's the great tribulation. Now, when is the rapture going to happen? Is it going to happen before the Great Tribulation? Is it going to happen in the middle of it? Is it going to happen at the end of it? There have been hundreds of books written about that subject. Also, is it going to happen before the Antichrist comes to power or 
after? You know, are we going to be here to see the Antichrist come to power? These are the questions that have been just raging. I looked at the whole deal, and I got to confess something. I have, over the years, I've varied. I've gone back and forth, back and forth, and I finally figured something out. You know where my position was? It depended on which was the latest book I read. <laughs> I can see you all relate to that, okay? Um, so I said, I think there's got to be a way to figure this thing out. And I got to tell you, um, I, I went on the most amazing journey. For months, I searched and searched and searched to find the answer to the question. Um, it felt like an Indiana Jones movie, you know? I mean, honest to God, it was like I found ancient manuscripts. I, I, found, um, I found clues that created more questions. I found codes that have to be deciphered. And in the end, guess what? It's just like Indiana Jones. I found the priceless treasure. It was truth, and it's absolute truth. There is no room for debate. I, I rarely would be this strong, but I know, I know that I know I found the answer. And I'm going to give it to you this morning, all right? So let's, let's start with something here. How many in this room would right now say, I already know, and I'm a hundred, absolutely a hundred percent sure when the rapture will occur in relationship to all those other things. How many are a hundred percent sure that you know? <laughs> awesome! It would really stink if I got up and asked that question. Every hand in the house went up. I'm like, whoa, we're a little late here. Uh, but yeah, you don't know. And I'm going to explain something to you about why you don't know and why all the books say different things. Um, I, I, somebody sent me a video. I listened to it about, I don't know, two weeks ago maybe. It was a really good video. And the guy would say something, and then he would, he would have a scripture to back it up. Everything he said, he backed up with a scripture. Now, that's what I call cherry picking, okay? You, you have something that you're trying to prove, and so you, you grab a scripture here, and then you find another one over here that seems to confirm this one, and finally you have enough scriptures to write a book. But, by the way, cherry picking is not bad. Every sermon I have ever preached, I cherry pick. Every sermon. Every sermon Pastor Kurt preaches, he cherry picks. It's not bad to cherry pick. But, but, if after all these books have been written, all these sermons have been preached, everybody has scripture to back up what their position is or their thinking is, and we still have no conclusion, we still just have debate, how many know we need to do something different? We can't just keep doing the same thing. We have to do something different. What I'm going to do here this morning is definitely something different. And I will absolutely guarantee you, before you walk out of here today, you will know the answer. And it won't be because I cherry-picked. You, know, you say, so how are we going to do this? What are you going to do that's different? Well, here's what I'm going to do. You remember the old financial ad about we make money the old-fashioned way. We earn it. Remember that? Some of you are too young for that. <laughs> what we're going to do is we're going to get truth the old-fashioned way. We're going to study. <laughs> All right? We're going to study. And we're going to spend our time in First and Second Thessalonians. And here's why. <clears throat> A lot of people don't know this. First and Second Thessalonians talks about the return of Jesus, both books. A lot of people don't know that in every chapter of First and Second Thessalonians, Paul talks about the return of Jesus. Every chapter, no exceptions. And I've I debated about whether I should just say that and then hope that you trust me and believe me. 
and I'm not too trustworthy, so I decided I would just read it to you, okay? So we're going to go through this as fast as we can. It won't take us but a few minutes. Uh, we'll start with 1 Thessalonians, the first chapter, okay? And I love the 10th verse. It's wonderful. It's really good news. By the way, all of these are really good news. How many know the return of Jesus for the Christian, for the church, is very, very good news? Come on now. All right. So uh, chapter 1, verse 10, it says, And to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. How many know that's really good news? Okay. We're, how many are waiting for Jesus? Okay. Uh, how many believe he's going to deliver us from the wrath to come? Okay, it, it, it just says it right there. You ought to believe it, okay? So uh, that's the first uh, chapter. Chapter 2, verse 19. What is our hope, our joy, our crown, our crown of rejoicing? Is it not even you in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? Hey, more good news? Yeah, yeah come on now. Now let's go to chapter 3, verse 13. To the end that he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God, even our God, our Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. More good news? Yep, everything's good news. Now, now I'll take a little more time with this one. Chapter 4, and this is, uh, some people don't know what the rapture is, and they're like, I don't even know what you're talking about. Well, here's what I'm talking about, okay? Chapter 4, verse 15 through 18 Paul says, for this we say unto you by the word of the Lord. Now, I want to just stop here a little bit and, and talk about that, by the word of the Lord. Paul wrote a total of, uh, uh, that we know for sure, 13 books of the New Testament, maybe 14 if you include Hebrews, but Hebrews is debatable whether he was the author there or not. But for sure, at least 13. And here's something you need to know. That phrase, I'm telling you this, by the word of the Lord, he never used that any place else in all of his writings. Why did he use it here? I'll tell you why he used it here. It's because what he was about to tell them, it, he knew it's going to blow their mind. He, he is about to tell them that there's coming a day when Jesus is going to return and there's going to be the sound of a trumpet and the voice of the archangel saying, hey, y'all, come on up here, and we're going to blast out of here. <laughs> the, the church is going to disappear in an instant. Now, now, I don't know about you, that's really amazing. That's, that's something that's just like, wow, that's like the most miraculous thing that any of us have ever experienced. And I should read it to you here. Uh, this we say by the word of the Lord. We which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent, that means simply precede, them which are asleep. The Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Oh, my goodness. Just where's the sign-up sheet? I'm signing up, I'll tell you. Now, now, some of you younger people, it maybe doesn't seem to be as appealing to you, um, especially if you're not married. <laughs> I had some of my grandchildren say to me, Papa, Papa, I hope Jesus doesn't come back before I get married. I want to get married first. And I understand that. I was young once, too. But can I tell you right now, at our age, it's like, wouldn't that be cool? Hon, we never have to taste of death. We can just, like, hold hands and pfft, we're out of here. <laughs> Nobody leaving anybody behind. Oh, boy, we talk about it. It's like that would be the coolest thing. So we're doing everything we can to live as long as we can. And by the way, I got that. I figured it out. 
I have that figured out. You want to live a long time? Here's, here's what you do. You make yourself so valuable to God down here that he can't do without you. Yep. Yeah, that's why we do our newsletter and everything we do. We're like, God can't get along without us down here. We'll grow. We'll, we'll wait till we're 125 for the rapture if we have to. I guarantee you wouldn't have to wait that long. But at any rate, that's really good news. We're going to just in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, we're going to disappear from planet Earth. How many are ready? Yeah. Well, so quickly, moving on, John. Chapter 5, verse 23. I pray, God, your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Again, all good news. Now we jump to 2 Thessalonians. You never heard a preacher go through a whole book of the Bible so fast in your life, did you? Now we jump to 2. Okay, 2 Thessalonians, verse, uh, chapter 1, verse 10. When he shall come to be glorified in his saints and to be admired in all them that believe. Everything, every mention of the return of the Lord has all been good news. Now, chapter 2, we're going to read the first two verses. And I'm going to change the, uh, the version here to the voice simply because it establishes what I've been trying to say to you, that the main emphasis of both books is the return of Jesus. And here's how it reads in the voice. Uh, verse 1, chapter 2. Since, brothers and sisters, we are on the topic of the coming of our Lord Jesus, the anointed, and how we will all be gathered together to meet him. We ask that you don't let your minds be quickly rattled or become anxious because someone says that they have a so-called spiritual revelation or because someone gave you a message or claimed to know of a letter allegedly from us reporting that the day of the Lord has already come. Now, everybody look up here. The, the day of the Lord is not referring to the rapture. The day of the Lord is found in, starting with the prophet Isaiah, there are seven Old Testament prophets that talk about the day of the Lord. And trust me, it's not going to be good news. The day of the Lord is described as a day of darkness, a day of gloom, a day of destruction, a day of judgment. All of those uh, adjectives refer to this thing called the day of the Lord. And apparently, somebody came along and said, I have a revelation. The day of the Lord, the day of God's judgment is upon us. And I even have a letter from Paul. Paul said this. So Paul's saying, I didn't say such a thing. I'm telling you, I never said that. So now he goes on uh, uh, to the third verse. And this is where we're going to camp. He says, let no man deceive you by any means for that day. What day? The day of the Lord. The of the Lord. You're with there. They're better than the first service. Yeah. <laughs> they were still at this point totally confused. Okay. Some of them said the rapture. No, no, it's not the rapture. The day of the Lord. That day shall not come. Don't tell the first service I said that. Okay. <laughs> that day shall not come. Come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed. Now, that, the, the, the fall, that a falling away, it's also translated, and I put it up here, and you can see I, I, I struck through falling, and I'll tell you why in a little bit. That's also in modern versions, also translated, there come a revolt first, and the man of sin be revealed, or a rebellion. Or an apostasy. King James, a falling away. Now, um, just we got to do a time out here, folks. First of all, I don't see any good news in that. There's, like, what happened to the disappearance? The disappearance has disappeared. There's no, where is the rapture in that? What are we supposed to be looking for? Our, and this is really, really pertinent. Are you supposed to be looking for that? For a falling away, an apostasy, a rebellion, a revolt against God, and the Antichrist to show up? Believe it or not, there are a lot of people today, they're looking for the Antichrist. 
I listened to another video the other day where some guy was teaching, and he said, I know of at least four to five candidates, one of which will be the Antichrist. I'm not prepared yet to tell you which one is, is the number one candidate, but in time, I, I'll, I'll tell you, because he's going to be revealed. I'm like, wait a minute. Paul's been telling us, look for Jesus to come back. And all of a sudden, wait a minute, I'm confused. Okay, why are we confused? I'm going to tell you why. As I started studying, I found something out. And I'm going to let you in on a little secret. I'm going to whisper it to him. There may be an error in the King James. <laughs> Ushers lock the doors. Don't let anybody out. Even if they say they have to use the bathroom, don't let them out. <laughs> they don't need to use the bathroom. They're going out to set up a stake in the parking lot and to gather some brush. They're going to have a marshmallow roast at the close of the service. <laughs> Before you burn me at the stake, give me a chance to explain to you why I say there's an error in the King James. Um, when I checked Greek texts, I found that the word falling was not in the original Greek text, not in any of the ones that we currently have. Um, let me show you what it reads like in the Greek. Here's what it reads like. Except there come a way first. That's how it reads. Except there come a way first. Now, I think it's a fair question. Why did they add it? Why did the King James translators add it? And I'll take a little time with this. You need to understand, I'm playing the devil's advocate here. You need to understand that translating from one language to another is extremely difficult. And the reason it's difficult is because uh, the original language does not have a corresponding word in the new language you're translating to, word for word, always the same. Uh, sometimes you start here in the original and you look up here in this language and it's like there's nothing. There is no word that is equal to this word. If it were, it'd be easy, but it's not. Let me give you an illustration. The Greek word kairos. How many have ever heard the word kairos? Okay. Okay. That's a Greek word. And here's what it means. So you're going to translate kairos into English. Here's how your translation would have to read. The perfect time to take action. That's what kairos in the Greek means. The perfect time to take action. So you can't just go, um, well, let's see. Is there one English word that covers all that? There isn't. That's why in modern English, People are just not even trying to do that. They just use the word kairos. Well, that was a kairos moment. <laughs> See? Uh, that, this is a kairos ministry, uh, meaning this is the time to act, the time for this ministry to do whatever it's doing. <sighs> Am I making any sense? Okay? So here's how, here's how it worked with this verse of Scripture. When the translators went back to the original Greek, they found that the word away, except there come away first. Away in Greek was apostasia or apostasio. And that means in English apostasy. Boy, it just got quiet in here, Pastor. It means apostasy. So... They said a falling away, apostasy. Other versions say something similar. By the way, there is not one modern version that doesn't hold to that translation. Fools rush in where angels fear to tread. I'm going to tell you they're all wrong. <laughs> Promise. What you need to know is that Anyone who's ever studied Greek knows that for any Greek word, there are multiple English words. 
that are used. This is found in your Bible over and over, almost everywhere you go. So the word apostasia is not always translated apostasy. It's also translated departure. Okay? And, and I'll prove it to you. I'll prove it to you. I think I may have left this out in the first service. I don't think I got to see it. But I'll prove it to you. Before the King James. King James was 1611. Before that, for hundreds of years, there were other English translations that are older than the King James. There are seven of them. Of the seven, all seven of them translate the word away as departure. All seven of them. I'll give you an illustration. This is why I don't think I gave them in the first service. Uh, the Geneva Bible in 1599, it's like 13 years earlier than the King James. Here's how the Geneva Bible reads. Exact quote, 2 Thessalonians 2, 3. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a departing first and the man of sin then be revealed. Ooh, I, I love hearing the, the wows. I, I didn't give you that verse in the first, in, in the first uh, that version in the first service. But now, don't get too excited. We're not even close to saying absolute. We have a slam dunk truth because departing. Um, that could mean two different things. That could mean, yes, the church departing from the planet, the away. It also could mean a departing from the faith. Are you hearing me? Okay. After all, that is prophesied in other places. Paul wrote to Timothy, he says, the day's coming. They won't put up with sound doctrine. We're seeing that today. Yep. In fact, I mentioned seven versions earlier than the King James. Two of the seven, yeah, they used the word departing, but they also included departing from the faith. So we're still here. We got clues, but we're still confused. We don't have an absolute answer. So which is it? How do we find out? Can we find out? We're going to find out. I guarantee you we're going to find out real soon. And here's how we're going to find out. We're going to find out by studying the word come. Throw that up there again, the Greek, how it reads in the Greek. Except there come away first. Um, the way we're going to find this out is we are going to determine what the verb tense of that word come is in the verb tense we will find our answer now um, there are there are actually about in, in Greek you don't just have like in English remember when you had to conjugate verbs in school oh, I hated conjugating verbs past present future I look at it now I'm like what's too hard about that okay in Greek it is extremely complex. You have about 12 different verb tenses, and then if you add the moods in, you're looking at over 20 options. Don't worry, I'm not gonna go give you 20 options. We'll be here till dark. But I'm go what I've done is I've, to, to make it apply towards our question of before, in the middle, at the end, all of that, in order to do that, I have narrowed it down to just two. Two, that would show us one way or the other, completely different. And the two, the two tenses are the present subjunctive tense or the errorist subjunctive tense. Now, somebody's like, good grief. <laughs> Dear God, I hated this in school, and I hate it worse now, and this moron gets up here, tries to teach us this kind of stuff. Do me a favor. Reach up, grab your earlobe. Just give it a gentle yank. There, you just turned your brain on. Now you're going to use it. <laughs> it's not hard. 
It's going to be very easy. I promise I'm going to walk you through it. What do these tenses mean? Present subjunctive, error subjunctive, subjunctive. What do they mean? I found a book published in 1860. It was a book called The Syntax of the uh, Moods and Tenses of the Greek Verb. It was written by Dr. William Goodwin. Who was he? He was the professor of Greek literature at Harvard University. And he was recognized as the foremost expert in the entire world of the Greek language. So what he did, he, he wrote this book. And then he did something that was like crazy. He sent copies of it, after he published it, sent copies of it to all of his peers around the world. And he said, here's my book. I invite you to critique it. I invite you to just go in and mark things out and put notations. Send it back to me because in the future, I'm going to publish another edition that's going to include all of this expertise and knowledge from all of the Greek, the best Greek scholars of the entire world. So in 19 years later, he published the sixth edition, and in it, he included all of their remarks. And I want to say, that book is a classic. It's still in print today, and it is used in universities around the world. It is so complete and thorough and right on. And, and you, can buy, you can buy it online. Amazon has paperback for about 35 bucks, hardback for about $55. Or if you're, you're a cheapskate like me, you can go online and read the digital copy for free. <laughs> Pastor, this is the coolest thing. They got it all there. And it, like a book is two pages. If you want to go forward, you click on the right page, and it just goes like that right to the next page. Want to go backwards? You can't. Oh, man, how cool is this for free? All right? So I started reading, and I looked in the table of contents, and I found where uh, he has in the table of contents, at this point, I deal with the present subjective tense, and here I deal with the aorist. Okay? You ready? This is so good. Page nine, here's what he says about the present subjunctive tense. Quote, the present subjunctive denotes a continued or repeated action. Some action that goes on, it's continued day after day, week after week, month after month, perhaps year after year, but it's an action that continues over a, who knows how long a period of time. Now, regarding what we're trying to find out, what does that sound like to you? That sounds like an apostasy. It doesn't happen in one day. It's been going on now for many years. Now, if, if, Come is in the present subjunctive tense. Then just shut my face and let me sit down because I don't, there, I, there's no way I could debate it. It's got to be talking about an apostasy. No doubt. You can't argue with it. Okay, I went ahead to page 26. The error is subjunctive. You ready for this one? Quote, the error subjunctive denotes a single or momentary action. If it's error subjunctive, it is talking about something that's one and done, and it doesn't take a year to get it done. It's done in a moment. His exact words. What's that sound like to you? Come on now. I, I, see, I told you, if you just pull on your earlobe, your brain would start working, and you'd get it. <laughs> this, this, this is not rocket science, folks. This is not brain surgery. Anybody can get this. So I, at this point, I'm starting to get really excited. 
I'm just like, I'm getting close. I'm getting close. I start thinking about Indiana Jones. And you, do you remember, you remember the, the Indiana Jones, The Last Crusade, where he goes to try to find the Holy Grail? And he comes into the chamber of the Holy Grail, and here's all of these chalices there. And this old dude that's been there for like thousands of years, and he's like, choose wisely. Okay? That's what came through my mind. Let's, let's just roll that video clip here. He chose poorly. It would not be made out of gold. That's the cup of a carpenter. so bad I wanted to show you the Nazi dude right before that chose not wisely <laughs> but but I didn't think that may be suitable for church so <laughs> hopefully you get older you get wiser but uh, so okay we got two cups we've eliminated all the rest we're down to two cups we got to find out don't we which cup is it present subjunctive or eris subjunctive. Pastor John, how in the world are you going to do that? Well, once again, I'm not smart enough, but I know somebody who is. And I refer to you guys that went to res when I was there and taught, especially on Wednesday nights. I referred to this over and over. Spiros Zodiatus, the, the foremost Greek expert of the 20th century. And his crowning achievement was his Hebrew Greek study Bible, where he put thousands of notations in, in with the text. That's where I went. And I, I'm going to give you, this is from his study Bible with a few modifications. If we'll throw that one up, 2 Thessalonians 2.3. Um, it's the King James, so I don't have to read it. We've already read it. I have highlighted falling in red because that's not in the original Greek. But it is in the King James, so there it is. But I want to draw your attention to, right before the word come, A-O-S-B. What in the world is A-O-S-B? Now, I'm going to get some help here. Pastor Kurt, how many trust your pastor? Okay, you're like... Yeah, I, I'm not sure if I trust you, but I trust my pastor. Okay, uh, Pastor Kurt, if you would, you just did you just happen to have a Zodiatus Bible with you today? That's miraculous, folks. <laughs> so if you mind coming up here and helping me, um, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait. Don't be offended. Uh, would you just give that to Pastor Emily? I've changed my mind. <laughs> How many trust her as much as you trust Pastor Kurt? Yeah. How many like to know why I changed my mind? Because Indiana Jones always has a girl helping him find the treasure. <laughs> oh, that's so evil. But... <laughs> All right, first of all, uh, if you'd open to uh, 2 Thessalonians, and right before the word come, tell us what is there on that page. A-O-S-B. A-O-S-B. Now, what does A-O-S-B stand for? It's a grammatical code. We got to unlock that code. We got to decipher that code. So 
Uh, Miss Emily, if you would turn back to the last book of the Bible, Revelation. You can find that one? Okay. <laughs> and then turn one more page and tell me what you read on the top of that page. Grammatical codes to the grammar grammatical notations. In other words, Zodius is saying, I am going to now tell you what all those codes are that you have found throughout this Bible. She's looking at a page that has two columns, a total of 58 line items. And Emily, I want you to look down on the left column. I want you to find A, O, S, B. Be careful, don't transpose any of those letters. It's not A, S, O, B. It's A, <laughs> O, S, B. Am I ever going to get saved? <laughs> I, I didn't do this the first service because I was feeling the pressure for time. I got to tell you a story on Miss Linda. When we were building our house up in the mountains after we retired, builder met with us one day and he said, okay, the framing is all done. And we said, well, what comes next? And he said, well, next we, we put on the OSB board, and then we put on the Tyvek, and then we put on the siding. And Miss Linda stood there with a perplexed look on her face. She says, so what does SOB stand for? <laughs> she was as honest and real. <laughs> and the builder, I, was, I wish I could have had a video. He stood there. And then he, Tried not to laugh. Finally, he just burst out laughing. He, he said, it's OSB. And she says, what did I say? <laughs> oh, priceless, priceless. Okay, you've had plenty of time. Don't mess this up. The future destiny of your entire church is hanging in the balance. Okay. Okay. So she has found AOSB. And what does he say it stands for? Air Aorist subjunctive. Bam! Slam dunk! Bam! It can't be anything else. It is talking not about something that goes on for weeks and months and years. It's talking about something that is a one-time event, and it happens in a moment of time. Come on! Somebody in this house get happy! And so now I'm going to cherry pick one verse, two, two verses. 1 Corinthians 15, 51, and 52. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. Church, listen to me. You're going to be hearing more and more about the Antichrist. And the reason you're going to be hearing more and more about it from Bible teachers is that Bible teachers interpret world events through the lens of the Scripture. And they're going to be saying to you, it's getting close. It's getting close. The Antichrist is on the planet today. He, he, it's all been set up, and it's just waiting for the right moment, <laughs> the Kairos moment, <laughs> to act. Hear me. When you hear that, do not let your heart be troubled. Instead, remember, if that's getting close, the rapture is even closer. Goosebumps. It's even closer. Do I believe that the coming of Antichrist is getting very near? I do. Absolutely, I do. But I'm telling you, the rapture is going to happen before that devil ever is revealed. And the question for you and I should be, are we ready? Are we ready? I want to tell you something else. It's an absolute fact. I guarantee it. There are some sitting in this room this morning who will be left behind. 
I don't care if Jesus comes on a Sunday when you're sitting in church. Sitting in church does not make you ready. I cannot think of anything more terrifying than to have that event happen and the whole world is thrown into absolute chaos and you know what's happened and you know you've been left behind. I, there's nothing that would be more terrifying. I'd rather die than to experience that. So are you ready? How do you know you're ready? I don't want to sound like I'm bragging, but the truth is I know I'm ready. And why do I know I'm ready? It's because Jesus is coming back for his bride, and I am madly in love with Jesus. I love him. I love him. I love him. And, and here's something else. I absolutely know I'm ready because I live my life doing what he is telling me to do. Jesus talked about that at the end of the 24th chapter of Matthew about his return. And he said, blessed is the man whom when his Lord comes, he finds him doing what he told him to do. That man's blessed. He's going up. And I'm not talking now about your occupation, whether you're an electrician, a, a plumber, a pastor. I'm not talking about any of that. I'm talking about daily, just being in the relationship with the Lord, having a true, working, living relationship with the Lord where you hear his voice and he tells you what to do. I'm telling you the truth. I feel more connected to Jesus now than when I pastored. It, it's, it's just... It's hard to put in words. But I know one thing. I'm doing what he, what he tells me to do. And I'm ready. And Linda and I, we're going up together. I know she's ready. She's holy. I'm kind of working on getting saved. <laughs> but I want to ask you, are you ready? Do you know it for sure? I said to Linda the other day, we were talking about this. I said, really, if people don't know that they're ready, that probably means they're not ready. You need to know that you're ready. You need to know it beyond any shadow of a doubt. And how do you know it? Have you truly made Jesus the Lord of your life? You pray a prayer, Lord, come into my life. But have you made Jesus the Lord of your life? Is he sitting on the throne of your heart calling the shots? This morning, I'm just going to ask you to do something the first service we had, I don't know, a couple dozen people that um, responded here. Um, if you've never asked Christ into your heart, you're not ready. Okay? I just can tell you that. You're not ready. But if you're also here and you have asked Jesus into your heart, but you just have really no relationship with him, you may come to church, but that's it. Your love for the Lord is cold, cool. You're not making Jesus the Lord of your life. You need to do that today. You need to do something that says, Lord, I want to fix that. I want Jesus to be the Lord of my life.